Good afternoon class. We're going to get started with our week two information for basic equitation. Um, this week we're going to focus on the correct way to tie our horses, um, how to groom our horses, as well as learn some of their anatomy. Okay. So I have my halter prepared. I have my lead rope laying across my left arm. Um, the right hand side I have my halter untied and to catch my horse. Um, so as I'm approaching Chrome, I'm going to approach at his shoulder. I'm going to let him know I'm here that I'm going to catch him. Go over the top with my right hand and then slide my halter up and over his nose. Then when I get ready to adjust it, I want to make sure that I tie it off and then I have it adjusted correctly. Um, so with him, you can see I have my nose piece sitting directly below um, those bones and then I'm ready to walk off and collect my horse to go and tie. So today we're going to start with tying our horses. There's a couple of things that we want to keep in mind and consider before doing so. It's important that we're always tying either at or above the wither height. The little red star in the photograph below shows where the withers are located on a horse. Ensuring that we're tying either at or above this point if this horse is to pull back, they're going to have less risk of injuring um, their neck and their back. But also, if we're tying at a lower point, we're going to run the risk of that horse reaching a front leg up and then tangling it within the lead rope. So it's important that we're always tying either at or above the wither height. We also want to ensure that we're tying to a stationary object. I know this horse in the photograph is tied to a horse trailer and a horse trailer on a case-by-case -case basis may be considered stationary. Some of your larger horse trailers, especially when hooked to a truck, would be considered a stationary object. However, I've seen instances where horses that are tied to smaller two horse trailers, they become spooked and pull back. You'd really be surprised how much weight a thousand pound horse with a significant amount of muscle, um, how much weight those horses can pull around and move, especially when their adrenaline is, is rushing from something that has spooked them. So that's something that we want to be careful of um, with tying to horse trailers. But as far as it goes here at the farm, uh, most of our tying that will take place will be up within our arena and all of the paneling and fencing up there um, is concrete in the ground. So all of these panels would be considered stationary um, at the facilities that we'll be using for our class time. It's important that we're tying our horse short but with enough room for some freedom of movement for the head and neck. In the photograph below this horse is tied at a very good length. Um, you can see that he still has some movement of that head and neck but he's not tied too loose. Um, horses that are tied loose, you know, they may be able to get their head down to the ground to graze and that's going to run a risk again of entangling their front feet within that lead rope. It's also important that we only tie with a lead rope and never reins. So in our first class meeting, you know, we went over what our halter was and what our lead rope was. So this horse is tied with a halter and lead rope. As we move further throughout the course and we begin tacking up and uh, bridling our horses, um, we will ride our horses with a bridle with a bit in their mouth and then reins. It's important that when we get to this point that we're never tying our horses with the reins. Um, these reins are made of leather and so if that horse does spook or, or pull back when tied they're likely going to break the reins but additionally they're going to have a bit in their mouth um, which can cause injury as well. So it's important we're only tying with a lead rope and never reins. There's a couple of different methods in which we can use to tie a horse, um, one of which, and most common, is a quick release knot. Um, the quick release knot, we're going to take the lead rope and place it around a secured post. Um, then with the slack in the lead, take a hold of the lead with both hands, bringing the rope under the right hand side that is attached to the horse. Um, so this is going to create somewhat of the letter four. And then I'm going to twist my left hand up to form a loop. At that point, I will then be moving um, to photograph number three. And with the lead in my right hand, I will bring it across and into the loop. Um, and then I will tighten it to secure it as shown as the far right hand photograph. 
Um, sometimes you'll have horses that have a tendency to nibble or pull um, at that at that loose end and so they could easily um, untie themselves with this quick release knot and so in that case we may want to daisy chain our lead. Okay, so now I have my object, my stationary object that I've selected to tie to. Um, I'm going to be tying to this ring right here. Um, my horse's withers are definitely um, below the point at which I'll be tying to. Um, so to begin tying, I'm going to take the end of my lead rope, um, feed it through. I'm then going to create a four. And this is going to be the quick release knot. After I have the four there, I'm going to loop up and then I'm going to feed back through. So then I can tighten that. So there we have our quick release knot. So all I have to do is pull that in and it automatically releases. So to go through that again, I have my lead rope through. I go underneath creating a four. I rotate my lead up to make a loop and feed through with the right hand side and tighten. So this one is going to tighten up, um, but that's going to be your quick release. Um, with your quick release, if this horse tends to be mouthy, he can pull the end of that and automatically untie himself. Um, so something to be aware of when tying the quick release is after I have it tied, I can then take and daisy chain it. So in daisy chaining it, I'm just gonna pull it back through itself. And at the end of the lead rope, I can loop it through. So at this point, um, if he goes to mouth and pull on it, he's not gonna untie himself. But again, I can easily release that by pulling and then releasing my lead rope. So that's gonna be for your quick release knot. Okay. The next type of knot I wanted to discuss in tying is a bowline knot. Um, a bowline knot is going to have a couple of different advantages. Um, it doesn't tighten up when the horse pulls back. There will always be some amount of slack that can be used to untie. Um, so if our horse is to pull back, we're not going to have to cut our lead rope to get them undone. Um, there will still be some amount of slack that we can get that lead rope untied once they release the pressure. Um, this is a, a great knot to use for younger horses and in the beginning stages, um, but is, is a beneficial knot to learn for not only in horses, but also a variety of other sporting events. Um, so in order to do a bowling knot, I'm going to form a loop as the first photograph shows. Um, this is what's going to be the rabbit hole. I will then um, put the rope end down through the loop as shown in the second photograph, this is the rabbit goes in the hole. Um, then the rabbit will go around the tree and then back up through the original hole. So once that's done, I'll, read, I'll be ready to tighten it and then my bowling knot will be completed. Okay, the next knot that we're going to do is the bowling knot. Um, so I'm going to start out the same. I'm going to feed the end of my lead rope through. Then on the right hand side, the horse that is the side that is attached to my horse, I'm going to loop that up. So this is what we're going to consider as the rabbit hole. This end here is our rabbit. So we go down through the hole. 
we go around the tree, so that's around the tree, and then we go back up and through the hole. So when I tighten this, it doesn't matter how hard I pull or he pulls on this. There's still gonna be slack right here so that when I go to release it, this knot is gonna release. So to go through that again, I'm gonna take the right hand side, I'm gonna loop it up. I'm gonna take the end of my lead rope and go down. I'm gonna go around the tree and then I'm gonna go back up and through the hole. So that's gonna how you're gonna finish your bowl one knot. Same deal if you have a mouthy horse, you can always daisy chain it um, or pull that back through the end so that if he goes to mouth and pull it on this, he's not gonna untie himself. And our third type of tying is using cross ties. Um, here at the Western Farm, we do have cross ties located within the equine center. Um, these are going to be tied on each side of the horse's halter. And the snaps that are used allow for a quick release. So on the right hand side, you can see a photograph of a panic snap. Um, so these we can pull and easily release them if we need to do so. This brings us into the grooming section of our lecture. Um, grooming is important as it improves the appearance of our horses. It removes dirt, sweat, glandular secretions, dead skin cells, and loose hair. While doing that, it's also going to bring natural oils to the surface of the skin that protect the horse from weather. It allows us the opportunity to also inspect the overall condition of our horse um, we're going to be able to closely inspect the skin, the head, the mane, the tail, legs, and hooves so that we can monitor their condition. For example, we may find ticks or bots that are adhering to the hair or the skin, or we may discover small nicks or cuts before they become a bigger problem. Grooming can also increase circulation. It relaxes the mind of the horse, and it also helps to build trust and confidence in building a relationship between horse and rider. Looking at a couple of our basic grooming tools, we're going to start off with the curry comb. A curry comb can either be rubber, as shown on the left hand side, or metal, as shown on the right hand side. Um, when I'm using a curry comb, especially our rubber one here on the left, I want to ensure that I'm using it in a circular motion. I'm going to move counter to the hair growth to dislodge dirt. I want to curry only the body the neck, and the upper half of the legs where there is fleshy tissue. I want to ensure that when I'm using the curry comb that I'm not doing the lower half of the legs um, or the face, some of the more sensitive parts of our horse's body. Once I've completed um, beginning my grooming with the curry comb, I will then move on to a stiff bristled brush. Um, sometimes these brushes are also called a dandy brush. I'm going to use this brush in the direction of the hair growth with the brush flat on the coat to remove more hair and dirt. With each stroke, I want to finish with a flick in the air. Um, we can also have a second um, similar brush that may be a finishing brush with thinner bristles. Um, so we can follow up our stiff bristle brush um, with another brush with less stiff bristles. I can then move on to combing or brushing of the hair. Um, we do have a hairbrush on the left, a comb in the center, and then on the right hand side uh, a mane and tail detangler. After that I'm going to be ready to pick my horse's hooves. Um, on the left hand side we have a pick that also has a stiff bristle brush on the end um, that we can use when cleaning the hooves out. 
On the right hand side you can see this handler has picked up their horse's hoof um, and they are beginning to clean out the hooves. I always want to make sure that when I am cleaning out the hooves that I use a downward motion as they are using. Um, that's going to be for the safety of both horse and rider. I want to remove any dirt, any rocks, any debris um, that is in that hoof. In the summertime, it's important that we're using fly spray. Um, here I have the Piranha and the Pro Force, um, just as a couple of examples, but again, there's a, a number of brands and such that we can select from and use. The sweat scraper is commonly used when we have um, already worked our horse, we've completed the workout for the day, they may be sweaty from their saddle. Um, we can take them in, rinse them off, and then use the sweat scraper to ensure that we're removing any excess water from their hair coat. Now that we've gone through our grooming tools, we're going to go ahead um, and do a demonstration on going through grooming. So I'm going to start, like we said, with our curry comb. Um, I'm going to want to do the fleshy parts of my horse's body. Um, so I'm going to do the shoulders, the neck, the rump. I'm going to do midway down his legs. I don't want to go further than halfway here. Um, no further than halfway on the front legs as well. And I don't want to go up further than his neck. I don't want to get up on his head with a curry comb. Um, so in doing so, I'm just going to move that in a circular motion. Um, I want to go against the movement of the hair in order to release all of the debris and the mud, um, any of the loose hair. You can see he thinks this feels pretty good right now. Wiggling his lips and moving about a little bit. So you see this whole time I'm keeping my free hand on him. Um, I can feel if he's going to move away from me or shy. Or... So now that I've got this side done, um, when I go to cross behind my horse, I always want to keep my hand on them and close behind them as I go around. And then I'm just going to curry this side the same way. Um, going across his neck, shoulders, and back down his side. So again, when I'm done, I need to cross back over. I'm going to touch him and stay close to his hindquarters and crossing around behind of him. Um, if you're not comfortable closely, crossing behind closely, um, if you do go behind the horse, then I want to make sure that I walk around at a safe distance to where he's not going to be able to kick me. So I either want to go um, at a far distance or I want to stay um, right up close behind his hindquarters and touching him. So those are your two options when crossing behind the horse. Um, next we're going to use our stiff bristle brush or our dandy brush, it can also be called. I'm going to go with the lay of the hair, getting all that loose dirt and debris and redding it from his coat that I already picked out with a curry comb. And I want to do a slight flick at the end um, just to further red his coat of dirt. I want to make sure with the dandy brush I'm getting anywhere the saddle is going to lay. Um, that's why I'm going down here on his belly and his girth area because um, that's where a portion of my saddle is going to set on him once we start saddling and riding the horses. So again, once I get done with this side, then I'm going to move about to the other side and do the same once more. After you use the stiff bristle brush or the dandy brush, um, you can then use a brush with a, a finer bristle, um, more of a finishing brush. So you can do a little variation if you're needing a cleaner coat or getting ready for a show or photographs or something like that. Okay, so once I'm done, then I'm going to move on 
to combing out his mane and tail. Um, for this one, I just use a brush. So I'm gonna go back to his tail, pull it to the side, um, and begin brushing at the bottom to rid it of any tangles. And then as I get the bottom brushed out, I can move up the tail further. But when I'm brushing his tail, I don't wanna stand directly behind him. I wanna pull his tail over to the side here um, while I'm brushing it. So once I get his tail brushed out, then I'll cross over here to his mane. So all of this here is gonna be the hair in his mane. So again, same deal, we're gonna brush that out. Probably could have gotten a little detangler here. I think he's got a few tangles. So once I've got his mane brushed out, um, personally, I don't like to brush the forelock unless my horse is untied. Um, so here we have his forelock. So I'm gonna brush through that very quickly. And then we'll be ready to tie him back. Um, brushing, you know, we've talked about how our horses have a blind spot directly in front of them. Um, so he can't see when I'm up there brushing on his forelock. So that's why I prefer to go ahead and untie them um, before I brush through the forelock. So at this point, I'm now ready to pick out his hooves. So I have my hoof pick. Um, I'm going to approach him. Let him rub down his leg, let him know that I'm going to ask him to pick up this foot to clean it out. So I'm going to rub down his leg, I'm going to lightly squeeze. He's going to pick up his foot for me, and then I can pick it out. When picking out my horse's hoof, um, we're going to have this, uh, here is known as the frog. And so I want to pick out along the edges of the frog and make sure that there is no, um, there's no rocks, there's no dirt, there's no debris in there. Um, when I'm ready to set that leg down, I wanna lightly set it on the ground and then I'll move to my hind leg. Hind leg, same deal, I'm gonna rub down him. I'm gonna slightly position myself where if he is to kick, I'm not gonna be um, in the way of that. And then I'm gonna reach down, same deal, and ask him to pick up that foot. The hind foot is gonna have the same anatomy as the front foot. Again, we have our frog in the center. I'm gonna use my hoof pick in the downward picking motion. When I've got that hoof cleaned out and I'm ready to set it down, I'm gonna let him place it back on the ground and then I'm gonna go around to the other side. When cleaning out hooves, I want us to always start on the front. So I'm gonna do um, the front on either side, do the hind leg on that same side. Then I'm gonna to go to the front of that off side, lightly squeeze and ask him to pick it up. There we go. Okay, then I'm gonna go to my back leg. And so then we'll be done with picking out of his feet. Um, the other tools that we did discuss using um, was our fly spray. So in the summer, it is important that we're spraying our horses for flies. Um, getting into the fall, we'll, we'll see how the flies are around the farm. Um, but when using fly spray, again, that's something that most of the horses there at the farm are gonna be desensitized to already. Um, I wanna make sure I'm doing the shoulder, the legs, the neck, back towards the rump and the back legs. Um, once I'm done with one side, again, I'm gonna go over going to do the other side in all those same areas. And so at this point, um, I've completed my grooming and I'm ready to move on to the task at which we have set forth for the day. Okay. So now that we have our horse groomed, we're ready to turn him back out in the pasture. Um, I want to make sure that as I untie this halter, I undo the buckle on my nylon. I'm going to ask this horse to soften his face towards me, and I'm going to release him. At the point of which I take that halter off, I want to immediately walk away from my horse. There's no more praise. There's no more interaction. Uh, if I want to pet him, I want to praise him, I'm going to do that before I release the halter. At the point of which I release the halter, I'm then going to walk away from him, um, and that's going to complete our session for the day. 
Moving into the anatomy component of our lecture, it's important to keep in mind that anatomy is objective with no judgment of the correctness of quality or how those different parts of the horse fit together, but rather the structure of a horse is essentially the basic map of a horse's body parts. Today we're just going to go over the basic anatomy that's covered in this photograph. Um, so this would be a really good reference point for study and then we will go into the next slide and look at this on a live horse. So moving into anatomy, it's important that we keep in mind that the anatomy is the different parts of the horse. Um, so we're not looking at her conformation, we're not looking at how she's put together, we're not looking at um, if she's good for a certain discipline. Um, we're purely just looking at her different anatomical parts. Um, so on her face here we have the muzzle, um, so this is going to be her muzzle. Um, up top here, at the top of her head, is the pole. Then we're going to move down in here, this is our throat latch. We then have the crest, the crest is going to be at the top of the neck. We're then going to move into our forelimb anatomy. So looking at our forelimb, we have the shoulder. We have the elbow here on the back. We have the forearm and the knee. Um, for the next parts, they're gonna be same with the forelimb and the hind limb anatomy. So we have the cannon and then we have the fetlock. So the cannon is this bone here and then our fetlock is at the joint. Um, when we move into our hind leg anatomy, we're also going to have the fetlock and the cannon. Um, when we begin moving up the hind limb, um, this joint here, we have our hock, and then we have our stifle um, here in the front, and on the hind quarters, we have our gaskin. Um, moving across the top, we're going to do across the top of our back. Um, so we already talked about the crest of our neck is the top of the neck, so that's the crest. Um, we then have our withers. So the withers again is when we're tying, we want to tie our horse's um, head to something either at or above the withers. So the withers are right here. We then have our horse's back, the loin, and then the croup. So moving across the top line, we have crest, withers, back, loin, and then croup. Um, the other commonly identified anatomy um, across our horse's belly this is going to be considered the barrel, and then down through here we have a girth. Um, so when we start looking at parts of the saddle, um, it'll be easier to identify where the different parts go and how they should lay on the horse um, if you know these basic anatomy parts. We've looked at a broad overview, but I thought it'd be beneficial that we look at the forearm anatomy specifically. So starting at the bottom at number 23, we have our horse's hoof. Number 22, we have the cornet. Number 21 is the pastern. Number 20 is the fetlock. Number 19 is the cannon. Number 18 is the knee. Number 17 is the forearm. Number 16 is the elbow and number 25 is our horse's girth. So that gives you a little bit of specifics and look into the forelimb anatomy of our horses. There are a couple of difference in our hind limb anatomy. Um, starting at the bottom we still have our hoof. We then move up to our cornet and our pastern, into our fetlock, then into the cannon at 38. At 37, we then have our hawk. At 36 is the horse's gaskin. 35 is the stifle. So the lower limb anatomy identification on the forelimb and the hind limb is going to be the same. Um, the differences are going to be beyond the cannon moving up the leg. Moving into the anatomy of a horse's hoof, 
later on in the semester, we will have a week that is dedicated to having farrier care and also equine dentistry, where we'll cover um, the hoof and its functionality and importance within the horse. However, I thought it was important that when going through anatomy, we do a little bit of a broad overview of the hoof. Writer Dick Francisco referenced the horse as a huge elemental beast um, that ran on four very small feet. And in order to prevent pain and unsoundness, taking proper care of those feet is essential. I think that's a, a very unique take, however it's, it's absolutely spot on in caring for our equine uh, friends. If farrier care is very important. Farriers are professionals who specialize in the care of a horse's hooves. A good farrier is knowledgeable not only about the horse's feet and the legs, but also their locomotion, about illnesses that affect the feet, and about a wide range of corrective and therapeutic shoeing that is required by the equine athlete. They also know how to shoe horses to correct deficiencies of conformation, to protect injured or delicate structures, and to keep the horse pain-free and sound throughout a lifetime of work. Fairs may fit shoes in concrete with a, or in combination with the farrier's recommendation as well. Um, oftentimes when we're experiencing issues with uh, laminitis and issues with our horse's hoof, we can go through and have an x-ray completed by a veterinarian. Um, and by analyzing that x-ray, then a farrier is going to be able to determine what corrective shoeing needs to take place so our horse is able to continue to perform in their line of work. This being said, oftentimes farrier services are scheduled six to eight weeks in most cases. Um, the hoof grows downward from the fleshy coronary band at the top of the hoof and the average hoof growth is about a fourth to three-eighths of an inch per month. So when we begin looking at the photograph shown, at the top we have the horse's skin where their hair is. Moving down we have the cornet or the coronary band. Um, as we discussed, this is going to be hoof growth um, occurs downward from this area. And then moving down um, we have the hoof wall. The hoof wall um, is made of a substance similar to fingernails and due to dryness, um, conditions, poor nutrition, or genetics, this material may be brittle and susceptible um, to cracks. When looking at the hoof wall, the front portion is our toe. Moving midway back, we have the quarter, and then at the back of the hoof, we have our heel. So we start at the front with our toe, move back to our quarter, and complete with our heel. The anatomy of the front feet and the hind feet, um, although the same, they are going to be shaped slightly different due to functionality. On the left hand side of your slide, we have the hoof of the forefoot, so this hoof is slightly wider and uh, more round. And on the right hand side, we have the hoof of the hind foot. The hind foot um, is going to tend to be more oval in shape and also a little bit narrower, so a little difference between the front and hind limb and the hoof shape. Um, beginning at the center, we have the frog of the foot. Um, the frog is a V-shaped structure in the middle of the horse's hoof, helps to absorb concussion and regulates the hoof moisture. It also assists the circulatory system by aiding venous flow of blood through a pumping action that occurs with each step that the horse takes. These photographs and diagrams are fairly detailed. Um, however, for the purposes of our class, as long as you know um, the purpose and the location of the frog, as well as the location of the bulbs of the hills and the sole, that'll be the only testable material um, from the diagram shown here. Although the hoof wall is not identified or labeled in this, um, going back to the sole of the hoof in this photograph, um, it brings me to note that the wall of the hoof, the outer hard lining that protects both the frog and the sole of the hoof, should be relatively smooth and free from cracks and rings, 
as rings are deep ridges that run parallel to the coronary band and they may indicate previous founder. Um, grass rings are much shallower rings that might indicate stress in the animal's life, such as the change in diet or environment. This should bring us to the completion of week two lecture. There will now be a assignment posted that is worth 10 points. Um, so get that completed and then you will be ready to attend the lab um, at your setup lab time at 10 o'clock this week.